Yo, what's happening, fam? I bet you weren't expecting that one, huh? So, um, you guys heard about like saving money and budgeting and changing mindsets and the lightning process. I don't know why you guys need me. I'm out of here. Um, when I get nervous, the opposite thing happens to me. My palms don't get sweaty, my feet get sweaty. And right now, it's like super sweaty. Um, and I kind of made notes, like they're rough notes, guidelines really, so I don't go off track, which I am already doing. Um, so guys, kia ora, nisam bula binaka, namaste, assalamu alaikum. I hope that gives you a sense of uh, where I come from. Uh, tonight, I'll be speaking from my heart and sharing with you some things that I haven't shared before with anyone in this kind of space before, ever. So it is a bit uh, nerve-wracking for me. Um, but yay, I'm here and I'm doing it. <laughs> um, yo, yeah, so uh, that's, my, that's my dog. Uh, his name is Jimbo. Um, he's about eight years old. Just took that photo a couple of weeks, uh, two weekends ago. Um, and I've got another dog. His name's Lucky. Um, yeah, love those guys. So... <laughs> Tonight, tonight evokes a sense of reflection. Reflection to find realization, and through realization, find application. And if you're not going to apply what you sort of realize, there's no point reflecting. So that's the main point. And then the second point I want to make is what the previous speakers have already sort of mentioned. It's about mindsets. It's about changing and lifting your game. And um, sometimes we tend to be stuck in phases of our lives and um, we don't know how to move forward so that's the yeah third point um how not to be stuck and move forward also so my life goal is to be sort of like funny so if you, you guys better be laughing um, <laughs> if you're not then it becomes really nerve-wracking for me <laughs> all right so so, what does reflection look like for me? Well, that starts by acknowledging my family and my ancestors and the single reason I am here today. Uh, you see, I am Indo-Fijian, a descendant of laborers brought to Fiji by the British between the 1880 and 1920, shit long time ago, um, to work in Fiji's uh, sugarcane plantations. They traveled to Fiji for the same reasons um, you know, people migrate today for better lives, for security, to um, build a future for their, for their kids and the generations to come. Um, so yeah, fast forwarding to 2000, and just a year before 2000, you know, I was six years old, maybe seven years old, I can't remember, but my dad, my dad had this freak sort of heart attack and it changed my world for forever. I was only, I was too little to realize what the heck was happening and I was, when, I, when my mom told me, I was like shit scared and I didn't know what a heart attack was and you know, how serious it was and uh, thank God it was just a minor heart attack. It wasn't, and it happened just after he, he finished playing soccer. Um, and I don't, we don't know what the cause was but apparently he had a fizzy drink and that may have caused the reaction, or I don't know, but he, he was okay, he came back home after soccer, and he, he went to bed, and he was sweating the whole night, and mom freaked out, by the time they went to the hospital, mom was crying, dad was not feeling well at all, there was pain all over his arm, and we're too little to understand what the heck was going on, and thank God, he made it through, um, the, doctor, the doctors did something, or. They must have done something. I can't remember. I, don't, I hate talking about it because it's scary as hell. Um, but he made it through, and then the year after that, we moved to New Zealand because there's a crew in Fiji. And at that time, my dad had a nice paying job. He was building a house. Um, and the coup happened, and it really pissed my dad off. And my mom was like, we might as well move. And leaving their home country and their families behind to move to New Zealand was a really scary thing. So. 2000 happened, and we moved, and I started primary school, and I thought, yeah, life will be sweet, I'm going to make some friends, ride some bikes, and <laughs> yo, it was sweet, I made some friends, and I rode some bikes, <laughs> and I mucked around heaps, 
but it wasn't without there's a test and strife. There was a lot of strife because um, we settled in South Auckland, and at that point in time, when I when we first come into a country and you're a migrant kid, you talk differently, and now I talk like a South Aucklander. I never used to talk like this. Uh, and, and you know, my English was alright. Um, but you, you, you sort of have to fit in somehow. And you have to learn a lot about the New Zealand culture and fitting in was very hard. You know, my first day in primary school, uh, we, my mom and I went to the principal there. He brought us in, he was trying to welcome us and all of that. I was like, yeah, sweet. Um, and then he's like, oh, we've put your son up a level. And I'm in my head, I'm like, woohoo, less time in school. <laughs> Uh, but only later to realize that I'm going to be struggling my whole life. <laughs> Everyone else is going to be like one step ahead and I'm going to be struggling my whole life. Um, and then, then what happened um, was my first day of high school. And, they, and, and it's an assembly, it's like Hogwarts. They put you in like different classes and shit. And I don't know, like, that's when probably Harry Potter came out and they started doing that stuff. Um, and... You know, all the kids that are not so great at maths and English get put into one class. And um, the shit thing is, everyone knows that that class is filled with dumb kids. <laughs> and I was in that class with maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 other kids. Um, they're all good though, they all crack up. Uh, <laughs> we had the best time. Three years, I remember. We, we, I know them so well, eh? Like, the last, next three years, we spent high school together doing all kinds of random shit. But I remember one class, uh, it was social studies. And uh, we had this teacher called Mr. T. And um, Mr. T uh, was a real cool dude. Real cool dude, probably in his like late 20s. Um, and me and the boys were mucking around, and he snapped. He snapped hard. He's like, Oi, shut the heck up. But in one of the ways he said that is, can't use those words. <laughs> and he's like, okay, if you fellas don't want to be in school, then what would you rather be doing? And then the whole class just kept quiet because we didn't know what the right answer was or what he wanted to hear. And he's like, come on. And then a few of the boys, a few of the boys said, uh, Sir, uh, I want to be playing rugby. The other boy was like, oh, I want to be a pro gamer. And I kept my mouth shut because I was scared. I was just scared. I just kept my mouth shut. And then he's like, oh, okay, okay. If you want to play rugby, if you want to be a pro gamer, you still got to put food on the table. You got to put food on the table. You got to have money to buy a game. And you got to have money for rugby gear. How are you going to do that if you don't have a job? And the boys replied, Oh, Mr. T, I'm going to be a professional rugby player. <laughs> and, uh, and the other boy was like, Yeah, and I'm going to be a pro gamer. <laughs> and I still didn't say anything. I just kept my mouth shut. Um, and then he's like, Well, if you fellas want to do that, you got to work hard. you got to work hard and build self-discipline. And I turned around and I looked at Mr. T. I was like, Mr. T, you sound like my dad. <laughs> and he took off his glasses, he put it on his desk, and he's looking at me. He's like, Z, what do you really want to do in this world? And I thought, I thought for a good couple of seconds, I was like, oh, I can't be a pilot. <laughs> Love my home too much. <laughs> um, can't be an engineer, too dumb at maths. <laughs> oh, sir, I just want to help people somehow. And he's like, he started laughing. He's like, can't you see I'm trying to help you fellas right now? So you fellas realize that you can achieve anything you want. If you don't like being called dumb at school, you can change that about yourself. You can work hard and change it. All you gotta do is work hard. And that starts right now, right here in this class. Um, and then that day turned into the whole year listening to his motivational talks. 
<laughs> and he went 110 yards for a group of kids that majority of society would have written off. Um, and in that moment, later on in life, I realized that he was instilling, instilling confidence, instilling hope, um, instilling resilience in us. So we don't start believing in things that we're not. Like being called dumb, you literally start feeling dumb. And then you don't know how to escape that sort of reality. You build a reality around it and that's it. You can end up not growing and limit yourself. And that's what I was doing for maybe the first or two years of high school. Um, when I get hot, my ears turn red. <laughs> it's tough, man, it's tough. <laughs> um, but the amazing thing was that after a whole year of being in this class and listening to his motivational talks, I did build a sense of hope, um, a sense of encouragement, a sense of willpower to be able to work hard and go on to do, you know, something else and not be just a kid. Okay. Um, and today, you know, so the boy who said rugby, that he wants to, wants to be a professional rugby player, he went on to become the captain of the Samoan national team. Right? He's one of my good friends, and he lives in Wellington now. He's a PT, he enjoys doing that off-peak, uh, off off-season, and then he goes into uh, rugby mode on season. And one of my other boys, um, who said pro gamer, went up to Silicon Valley, started developing games, working big time. And one of my other mates who was in that class, he went on to become Discovery Channel's first global intern. We're all from the same classroom, all doing same dumb shit together. <laughs> and, I, you know, I ended up doing what I'm meant to be doing. I feel like I'm happy with that. Um, but yeah, moral of the story, of that story, there's another one I'm going to tell you. I'm not done yet. <laughs> you know, my time, oh shit, 8 o'clock. <laughs> we passed that line. Um, but yeah, Mr. T taught us a valuable lesson. You know, don't give up, don't give in to labels that people put on you. Now, um, the second story I'm going to tell is a bit more when I was uh, sort of finding my own foot in the world and where things weren't going so great, because I fell in love, and um, she was an incredible girl, um, but I messed it up by the time I was 19, uh, mainly because I, was, I wasn't faithful, and I let her down. Uh, yeah, and I'm not proud of that. She knew and she even forgave me, so I asked her to marry me. I asked her to marry me, and when I looked at her every day after that, I saw pain in her eyes, and it was silent, silent as hell, but it was there, and I hated myself, and we didn't go through with it. Um, I couldn't do that to her. The following year, I, before, before, the last thing she ever said to me was, you got to learn humility. And I thought I knew what humility was, but I was completely off the mark. In my 17, 19, 18 years, I was Mr. Popular. Uh, and that was the last thing she ever said to me. And uh, the following year was pretty rough. I was getting used to uni, trying to fit into uni, uni life and how things are done there. If you don't know, the, the stats out of South Auckland is not that great for kids making it to Auckland University. They usually go into trade or MIT or other sort of universities. Um, but yeah, there's not many of us. Um, so I had to make new friends and get used to it. And it was kind of rough. Uh, and at the same time, I felt guilty. You know, guilty about how that ended and how much I hurt her. Um, at the same time, I had I was playing really, really good football. Uh, first division, Premier Division. And during the season, I hurt myself. My shoulder was gone, had a reconstruction done. My knee was gone, ACL, done that. So back-to-back -back injuries, six months on, six months off, two consecutive ones. 
And that put me off. I was so pissed off. I was not happy that I wasn't playing football for a whole year and a half. Um, and I was struggling to keep up with the other kids in class. They were all getting A pluses. I never got an A in my life. Um, yeah, and really self-pity kicked in pretty hard. And, and it felt shit. It felt like I wasn't moving forward. I was mentally stuck with no clear direction. I just started feeling like I'm no good. No good to anyone. Um, and then I think it was my third year of uni, fourth year, I can't even remember, but I moved out of home mainly because I wanted to clear my own head, find my own sort of space and identity. I moved home, I moved out of home, moved into an apartment with a bunch of hooligans, ended up going town, partying hard, getting drunk, getting into fights, and I kind of like getting into fights. Felt like it's a good way to punish myself. And because, I don't know, I was going through a rough patch. I, I, I can't even explain that feeling, but I was in destructive mode, and I knew I had a problem. Um, and because I started believing that I was just no good, putting labels on myself. Um, where am I? So, New Year's Eve, 2013. Um, I found myself tipsy, not drunk, tipsy up Mount Eden. I'm not promoting alcohol, working public health, don't do that shit, alright? <laughs> <laughs> if you do, responsibly. Please. <laughs> uh, but yeah, 2013, um, I was up, uh, up on Mount Eden, um, and I was just like waiting for the sunrise. I was like, yeah, just might as well, I'm awake. So, sunrise is coming, and then I realize I'm probably hitting rock bottom, but the view looks pretty good from here. And, and then I looked up humility. I actually looked it up. And when you look up humility, you get a whole list of like words. And pride came up. So I clicked pride. And then a whole set of words came up. And arrogance, vanity, self-importance, conceited, egotistic. And all of those words were words that I was scared of. Deep down, I never wanted to be any one of those words. Um, and I felt like I lost my way, and I needed to pull myself together that morning, somehow, anyhow. So right next to egotistic was self-love. Never heard of the concept before that. Uh, maybe I have, but I haven't paid attention to self-love. And if you look it up, if you look up, if you follow those steps, you'll find self-love right there. So I looked it up. A whole list of blogs came up, um, and I started reading. I didn't have a lot of battery life. Read one, read two. Interesting battery died. Went home, charged the phone, read some more, um, and sort of started understanding what self love was really about. It's quite different from being being an egotistic asshole. Um, sorry, sorry. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, I think, a moment of realization for me that I was um, putting ideas into my own head that I was no good, that I was, um, and maybe I was no good for some people and I realized my mistakes and I wanted to turn my life around. And I worked super hard. I worked the next two years. I worked harder than probably anyone in my class. I got an A, an A minus. A minus still counts. <laughs> got my GPA high enough to um, get into a master's program um, all within two years, you know, worked harder, went to the gym, got fitter, got smarter, um, and actually, you know, did things with all of my heart, um, and I was kinder as well. I tried to, you know, try to break that sort of macho thing that was going on with me, and then I, I realized there's no harm in that's actually a beautiful thing, not trying to be macho all the time, because it's kind of a dick. It's no, yeah. So if you're trying to be macho, it's, honestly, it gets you nowhere. <coughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, after that, worked hard, got through uni, started playing soccer again. Um, and all my life, I've been doing odd jobs, man. I've even, I've, I've even like, washed cars. Washed cars, worked in a butcher, driven a taxi, um, 
sold, sold stuff, the promotional stuff, and I was kind of over all of that scrappy stuff. And then I was like, not that I'm like dissing it, all right? If anyone's in those professions, I admire you guys very much. Right? Those are the things that get you through uni, and you should never give up. A job's a job. But I knew in my heart that, you know, like my purpose is not to be there. That's just a, you know, a process or a vehicle to get me to where I want to be. My goal, my end goal, what is it? I didn't figure that out till I was like um, 20, 22, 23. 23. Um, and then I finished my master's and someone saw it was really good and they encouraged me to pursue, you know, public health. So I, you know, pursue public health with all my heart because I understood the value behind public health is all about addressing social determinants of health. It's addressing poverty and helping people. If you do it in the right way, you can create systemic change in society and the world can become a beautiful place. But it's more complex than that. <laughs> and I've been hitting my head for the last three years and I've made a little bit of difference and I'm happy with that but that's what you gotta take, you know, if you're working within a system to change it and um, you gotta, you know, make little goals for yourself and make little goals for your project and work towards them and, and celebrate those successes. All I'll say now is to wrap things up because I've already taken too much time is that um, you know, sometimes they, it may feel like you're stuck and there's a brick wall in front of you and it's real hard to punch through. Or sometimes you're looking at a goal and it's too far away and the picture's muggy. It's probably because it's meant to be muggy, right? Sometimes you just gotta grow up a little bit more, figure out, um, you know, what will actually get you there. Um, reading and educating yourself um, helps. Like listening to people who have been there, done that also helps. A lot of things help. And, and once you, when the timing is right, that picture will become clearer. But you gotta believe that it will get clearer, and you gotta believe in yourself. If you do those two things, and you also say, I am gonna do it, because application is number one. So if you say you're going to achieve your goal that year, whatever your goal is, make sure you do it. That's the number one thing, doing, and then reapplying yourself. Um, to get yourself further. And also don't wait a new year. A new day is a few hours away. Or the next hour starts in another 50 minutes. So you could be a new you in 50 minutes. All right, so that's me. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. Thank you.